In this lesson, we'll learn about a very important flavor of reaction called a precipitation reaction. In a precipitation reaction, two soluble substances combine into an insoluble substance. You will need to learn the solubility rules in order to know which substances are insoluble. Then you will need to be able to write a new kind of reaction equation, the net ionic equation, which focuses on the insoluble bits. In the last lesson, we learned that soluble substances dissolve in water, while insoluble substances do not. One chemical reaction turns two soluble substances into an insoluble substance. This is called a precipitation reaction. You may have heard the word precipitation applied to the weather to mean stuff falling from the sky. In chemistry, we think of precipitation as stuff falling out of solution. As a cheesy chemist, I like to think of precipitation as two ions falling in love and deciding to live together at the bottom of a beaker. Precipitation reactions all follow the same general pattern. On this slide, soluble salts are shown in blue and insoluble salts are shown in red. A precipitation reaction starts when two soluble solutions are mixed together. This allows two ions to meet and fall in love. In the picture to the right, a solution of potassium iodide is added to a solution of lead to nitrate. When potassium locks eyes with lead, the music slows down and the two ions are immediately attracted to each other. They form a beautiful yellow solid, which sinks to the bottom of the container. The product of a precipitation is an insoluble solid. It is a new compound not originally present in either of the starting solutions. A precipitation reaction removes ions from solution. In this case, lead to and iodide ions. However, just like in a romance movie, precipitation reactions require some actors to be extras, which we call spectator ions. The spectator ions are always soluble, so they stay in solution and mind their own business. In this example, potassium and nitrate are spectator ions. There are three ways to write precipitation reactions, and you will need to be fluent in the first and the last. The way we've already seen them written is as a molecular equation, which shows a potassium iodide solution mixing with a lead to nitrate solution to form a lead to iodide solid and a potassium nitrate solution. The complete ionic equation splits up all the soluble ions. This equation is closer to the truth since ions are separated in solution, but it's less useful to us because of how long and cumbersome it is. However, we need to write the complete ionic equation in order to get to the most useful form of the equation, the net ionic equation. Notice how in the complete ionic equation, identical substances exist on the left and the right side of the arrows. In math, this would be like having the same operation on either side of an equation. Because the potassium ions and the nitrate ions are not changed during this reaction, it's safe to remove them in the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation focuses only on the most important thing, the burgeoning love between iodide and lead. It is the most useful for us because it zeroes in on the precipitation reaction. Okay, time to practice it yourself. Try writing the three kinds of reaction equation for the reaction between silver nitrate and sodium chromate in which insoluble silver chromate precipitates. Here's the answer. The molecular equation shows our two soluble compounds forming an insoluble product, but includes the soluble spectator ions as sodium nitrate. The ionic equation splits apart all aqueous compounds into their ions. Then the net ionic equation eliminates the spectator ions to focus in on the real chemistry, silver meeting chromate. 
you will need to be able to write the products of a precipitation reaction. There are three steps in doing so. First, note all the ions which are present at the beginning of the reaction. Then, consider what combinations of cations and anions are possible. Lastly, look up all those combinations in your solubility rules to decide whether any of the combinations are insoluble. If something is insoluble, then a precipitation reaction will occur. Here are the solubility rules you will need to know. I'm sorry, it's a lot. I promise that we're getting all the nasty memorization out of the way first. This table and the naming rules are, in my opinion, the worst things you'll encounter in Chem 101. I've divided the table into three categories. The greens are always soluble with no exceptions. These are the most important ones to memorize. The yellows are usually soluble, but there are some insoluble exceptions. The red category are usually insoluble, but there are some soluble exceptions, especially when those are paired with things in the green, which are always soluble. Let's apply the steps and the solubility rules to predict whether mixing silver nitrate with potassium bromide will lead to a precipitate. Pause the video and see if you can predict which precipitate will form. First, we separate the aqueous substances into their ions, silver, nitrate, potassium, and bromide. Then we list all possible combinations of cation and anion. The new combinations for this mixture are potassium nitrate and silver bromide. Consulting our solubility rules, I find each of the compounds on this table. First, I note that nitrate, which I've colored blue, and potassium, in purple, are always soluble, which means that three of the compounds above cannot be the precipitate. I told you that it pays off to memorize the always solubles. Lastly, I see that bromide is usually soluble, but when I check its exceptions, I see that it's insoluble with silver. Bam, that's how we know that silver and bromide are the ones who fall in love and form an insoluble product. This is a visualization of the solubility rules. Notice that the first four rows and the first four columns are always soluble. I strongly suggest you start your memorizing here. You'll get the most bang for your buck. If we want to use this diagram to determine whether calcium chloride is soluble, we'd find the entry for calcium and find the where it interacts with the entry for chloride and see that it's yellow, which indicates it is soluble. On the other hand, for magnesium hydroxide, we'd find the intersection of magnesium and hydroxide, which is colored blue, indicating insoluble. If you're someone who likes to visualize things on the periodic table, please note that the alkali metals in group one are always soluble. The halides in group seven are almost always soluble. Also, mixtures of group two and group six are always insoluble because the ions have large charges. A two plus ion and a two minus ion are hopelessly attracted to each other. Let's finish up by returning to the pattern of precipitation reactions. Two soluble substances meet. Their ions switch partners. One pair is usually very soluble which is why you should memorize the always soluble category first. This pair makes up the spectator ions. The other pair is usually insoluble and it is the precipitate. If the other pair is also soluble, then no reaction occurs. Lastly, the net ionic reaction eliminates the spectator ions to show only the two ions meeting and forming an insoluble compound.